Hello everybody, this is Tim once again here, finally with my first uh, film review for the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. I have the four pack here. Used to have the box set a long time back, but uh, I lost it over the years. The disc got too scratched up after so many times watching them. Um, so I decided to go ahead and buy the cheap four packs for both of them. Well, the first four and then, you know, the other four. Freddy vs. Jason added on. Just got done watching this film. Um, the film is directed by Wes Craven. It's a director I like. Uh, this film stars John Saxon, Ronnie Blakely, Heather Camp, introducing Johnny Depp. Written and directed by Wes Craven. Okay, this is the film that put New Line Cinema on the map. It pretty much created New Line Cinema from the ground up. So this is their boy. This is their mascot, pretty much. They might as well have like a giant Freddy poster in their office if they don't already. Which, for all I know, they probably do. But yeah, this is a really, this is a really good film. Um, it has flaws. It's not. It's. Um, I don't think it's as good as Texas Chainsaw Massacre or the first Halloween, but it ranks up there in at least the top three, uh, or top four best slasher films ever made, and it's one of my favorites. It's a terrific film, but anyway. Um, Robert Englund plays Freddy Krueger in the film. He's excellent. He cannot be replaced. Um, I love Robert Englund. He just, I mean, I'm sure there's another actor that could, 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 could do the role justice, but as of now, I have not seen that actor. He does not exist to me, but you never know what they might be able to do, might be able to do in the future, but as of right now, I, I do not see anybody being able to pull off the Freddy as good as uh, England does it. But anyway, we'll get to that when we get to the remake. But to jump into the first film here, it's directed by Wes Craven. Um, Freddy Krueger, the character, is named after a guy who used to, uh, uh, a boy who used to bully uh, Wes Craven in school, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, the look of Freddy is based off like some hobo who scared Wes Craven when he was a little kid. Like he was in his, uh, he was in his house with his brother. And like the fucking hobo was like staring through the window or something like that, like creeping him out. And he went up to get his brother. And when his brother came down with a baseball bat, the guy was gone. Uh, that's actually a pretty creepy story. That could be a movie within itself, really. <laughs> but he kind of based Freddy Krueger's look off that guy. So that's cool. Um, the striped sweater that Freddy wears, red and green, are supposed to be the like two hardest colors for the human eye to process when they're combined together. Which that's pretty neat, too. <laughs> Uh, so all those things combined together, plus Robert England's great acting as this uh, lovable asshole character, is just terrific. Um, the character of Freddy himself started out as like a child molester and child murderer, but in the film they focus more on like, the, well they pretty much focus on the fact that he's a child murderer, but you get the hints that he probably was a child molester too, and I mean anybody that's going to kill children, you know, obviously would molest them too, or, or at least, you know, wouldn't have a problem with doing it. So... You get the idea that he probably was a child molester too, which I don't like child molestation at all, but this being a fictional film and this character is supposed to be like an abomination to humanity, <laughs> I'm okay with it. I know some people don't like that because they're used to Freddy being like the late night talk show host kind of Freddy and the more laughable, fun kind of Freddy, but with the darkness of this film, it fits because this film has a very dark tone and it works. Um, I'm going to jump straight into the film here. We got the character of Tina at the beginning. She's kind of like a red herring, kind of like Janet Lee from the first Psycho film, who thinks she's going to be the lead, but she's not. Um, so in, in the uh, beginning of the film here, she's having a nightmare. We get a terrific score in this film. It's really spooky. She's having a nightmare. You get this really funny, kind of funny thing with this fucking lamb. This lamb, like, jumps out for a jump scare. Like, the lamb jump scare or something like that. And I'm like, you... <laughs> I, that's a reference to something I forgot what Wes Craven said it was a reference to. You don't really need that in the film, but it doesn't hurt the film really. But you don't really need it. But uh, and so you get like Freddy like following her around and he's popping up at different spots. Oh, and before I forget the opening, the first scene of the film is him Freddy building his glove, which is a really cool opening. I love that opening. That's my favorite opening of any of the Nightmare on Elm Street films with him just building his glove like that, putting it together in kind of like a uh, crude workshop. No, that was cool. I love that. Favorite opening of the entire franchise. But, um, and then you get a jump scare with her, like, she's screaming and all at once. Freddy just jumps up behind her, and then she wakes up, and her, uh, 
clothes her nightgown I mean has been slashed which is kind of cool but the jump scare there's a couple scenes in the film where Freddy kind of like leaps out from behind bushes and stuff uh what separates this film from other slasher films is the is the really creative and cool idea of Freddy of Freddy killing people in their dreams of the slasher slashing people in their dreams because you can do anything in dreams so therefore this character should be like unbound you know he should be able to do anything that the director can think of or anybody working on the film can think of so that's what I love about this character in this franchise. So when he just jumps out from behind bushes and stuff like that, I'm kind of like, eh, lame because, you know, he can do anything. So, you know, when you bring him to the level where he just jumps out from behind stuff, that kind of makes him seem just like an ordinary slasher when he should be able to transform or do anything. That's what I like about some of the other sequels because, you know, they had more special effects. They can do more there, but they also take away from the character a little bit, make him a little bit too magical and take away from his grungy, dirty feel that he has in this film, which I like. But um, you do get some really creative stuff, though. Don't let me lie. I mean, or, or misrepresent the film here. I mean, because you do get some really awesome creative stuff in this film, dream-wise, and it's really cool. And that's what I love about the film. Um, there's not too much to dislike about the film, other than the couple of uh, jump out from behind bushes stuff. Other than that, really, the only other thing I don't really like is the ending. The ending makes no fucking sense whatsoever. It is a horrible ending to this film. Uh, it's not Wes Craven's fault. I mean, him and the, the producer, Bob Shea, were fighting over how to end the film. Bob Shea wanted it to be a franchise. Craven didn't, or he didn't think it could be a franchise. He wanted a happy ending and just end it with Freddy dead, and that's the end of the movie. Which is understandable. I mean, some movies would have been better off like that. But Freddy's a character, I think, benefits better from having a franchise. And I think he's better off for it, actually. Um, it's just that some of the films in the franchise, you know, get shittier and shittier. So, as with every franchise. but Anyway, I think this is a character, though, that can carry a franchise pretty well. Because he can come back in dreams, and you can do so much with that. Just so much, I don't even think some of the movies in the franchise took advantage of. But, just to focus on this film here. So, uh, other than, I'll get to the ending uh, after uh, I get done with this plot summary here. But, um, so Tina wakes up. Uh, she starts telling her friend Nancy, played by Heather Lankenkamp. Who uh, she's a good actress. She does fine in the film. She has a few scenes where she has to uh, be oh, like overly emotional, where she has to cry because Tina's dead in the film, and that's the only time that she kind of her acting's a little eh, a little if, a little iffy. But other than that, she carries herself really well in the film. And Johnny Depp is in the film. This being his first movie, he his acting is just kind of decent. I mean, you, you know, I I like Johnny Depp. I'm a fan. But you know you don't get you really don't get the idea that he's gonna be like you know super mega star when he when he does a couple more films when when he does Pirates of the Caribbean in the future you don't really get the idea that this is the guy that's gonna do that but mostly not really because of him but because his character is just kind of dull he's not really much to him he's just kind of there I mean he just kind of rounds out the cast he doesn't really do anything in the movie and uh, but he gets the my second favorite death scene in the whole film <laughs> which I'll get to. But yeah, he's kind of just decent because his character's kind of just, eh, just there. There's not really much to him at all. But, um, and so Tina's telling her friends, Nancy and her boyfriend Rod, which is kind of like this, uh, I think the actor's name is Nick Corey, who plays the character. It's kind of like this rebel, rebellious type guy who he carries around a switchblade. Uh, he does fine. He's alright. <laughs> he's got a funny scene where they're, like, spending the night with Tina, uh, uh, Heather Lankenkamp and Johnny Depp are, he fucking shows up there and like jumps Johnny Depp with a jump scare, scares him, and he goes, what's going on here, an orgy or something? <laughs> and I, I thought that was funny. <laughs> always a good orgy joke, you know, it's always funny. But, uh, so they're all spending the night at Tina's house because she was scared by her dream. And then uh, you get a funny fucking scene here where uh, Tina and Rod are having sex, which uh, and Johnny Depp's like listening. Heather Langenkamp won't give him none in the movie, and he's fucking, like, listening to it upstairs, and, uh, he's sitting there on the couch, and he's like, reality sucks. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. I actually liked that moment. That was some good humor. Um, but, uh, Tina, you get a real, oh, yeah, uh, you get a really cool scene here where fucking Freddy comes out, like, from behind the wall. It's a really effective scene and really good practical effects. I really like this. It's done so much better than in the remake with CGI. It just looks like a glop of CGI shit in the remake. We'll get to that, but uh, anyway, uh, so he like he's like coming out of the wall, which is really cool, and he kind of like he fades back into the wall, which is really neat. Um, and then the Latina's having a nightmare, and there's like fucking like a scraping at her window, which is a really cool, effective, creepy scene. You hear Freddie like saying her name like T 
Tina, <laughs> which is really cool, kind of like a whisper type voice. It's really cool, really spooky. Would have scared the fuck out of me if I woke up in the middle of the night and somebody was scratching at my window saying my name like that. I would have been scared to shitless, to be honest. But uh, but you do get some stupid shit here. She actually fucking like goes outside to see who it is who's like hollering at her or talking to her. I thought that was pretty fucking stupid. I mean, who the fuck is gonna go outside in this situation here and somebody calling your name like that? Who the fuck is gonna go outside? I, I don't know who would do that. I wouldn't do that. Kind of seems like a dumbass horror movie moment. But the stuff you get afterwards, you know, holds up and makes up for it. She's out in, like, the middle of the fucking hallway, and Freddy's arms are, like, stretched out, like, nine, nine nine miles long, and fucking, he's, like, scraping against the wall, and she's like, please, God, and he he's like, he looks at her and goes, this is God. <laughs> That's a really cool, effective scene, good line of dialogue there. Really sets the tone and the mood of the picture and lets you know what kind of character Freddy is. <laughs> he fucking chases off after after her, and you get a funny scene here where he, like, jumps out from behind a tree, fucking, like, says, hey, Tina, and lifts up his hand and fucking <laughs> slices off his fingers. I thought that was pretty funny. Then he attacks her, and you get some really cool creative dream stuff here again, um, where she, like, fucking grabs his face and pulls it off, and he's, like, a skeleton face underneath. That was cool. Um... And then all, well, she's like kicking around in the bed and Rod like wakes up and he's wanting to know, you know, what the fuck's wrong with her. And she, he gets knocked down and then she fucking gets drug up to the ceiling and cut all the pieces and falls down on the bed. And it's a very brutal, brutal scene. And that right there is just a fucking awesome death scene. The special effects are just the, like the cuts on her chest just appearing like that because she's getting cut in a dream. It's just really cool. Um, Freddy being a character, of course, that whatever he does to you in dreams happens to you in reality, or at least as much as he wants it to. So that's cool. That was an awesome uh, death scene. I love that. So obviously, Rod gets blamed for the murder. Um, he runs off, gets the fuck out of Dodge. Uh, Nancy goes to school the next morning. Rod, like, jumps her and fucking tries to tell her he didn't do it. But uh, Nancy's dad is a cop played by John Saxon, who does fine in the parental role. Um, he uh, fucking arrests his rod and takes him to the fucking jail cell. And then uh, that night, um, well, Tina's like, I mean, not not fucking Tina, but Heather. Or, yeah, Heather Lankenkamp. Well, I'll just call her by her character name, Nancy. She's talking to Rod, and he's, like, telling her that he had a dream about Freddy as well, which is pretty cool that, you know, they all start realizing they've all had, a, you know, the same dream about this guy. But, um, so she decides to, uh, Go to sleep and see if she can find Freddy and gets Johnny, uh, gets Johnny Depp. Well, Glenn is his character's name. To uh, stay up and uh, watch her, I guess. Watch over her, I believe. And uh, so she goes to sleep and tries to find him. You need a uh, scene here where she's like, and, and obviously in a dream, and she looks back and says, Glenn, are you still watching? And Johnny Depp steps out like from behind a tree or something. It's kind of like, you know, is it a dream or is it not? Nah, I like that kind of stuff where Russ Craven's trying to, like, play with the audience, you know, trying to get him to think, you know, is it a dream or isn't it? But, you know, it's obviously a dream because she did, she was going to sleep <laughs> a while ago. So, I don't know. That scene, you don't really need that. But it, it still works good. I don't mind it. But, um, she's in a dream and you get some, uh, get some cool stuff. Fucking like where she sees uh, Tina standing there in a body bag and she's like got bugs and shit coming out of her mouth, which is pretty cool. She sees like Freddy walk through the bars in Rod's jail cell, which is pretty neat. Um, um, Freddy chases off after her. She runs back into her house. Glenn has fallen asleep, so he's not watching her like he was supposed to. Um, Freddy fucking like, um, though the, the stairs turn, the steps turn to quicksand on the stairs, which is pretty cool, which would be reused again for New Nightmare. Uh, Freddy, like, fucking, uh, leaps through the, the glass, the wind, the mirror, there's, like, a mirror hanging on her door, and she closes her door, it's, like, hanging on the, the side where she's, uh, well, inside of her room on the side of the door where she's at, Freddy fucking, like, leaps through the door and comes straight through the mirror, and it breaks through, and he, like, comes through the glass and grabs her and attacks her, fucking starts slicing up the pillow, and there's feathers everywhere, which is really cool, and then she wakes up from her alarm clock, they go to check on Rod, this death scene right here is a little confusing, um, Freddy hangs him in his jail cell to make it look like he committed suicide, which is cool. I like that. It shows Freddy's not stupid, and he wants to kind of cover up some of the murders to make him look like suicide, so people won't suspect something is going on, which, you know, is pretty cool. I like that idea. Um, but uh, it kind of seems like Rod's awake while it's happening, or maybe it's just like what he's seeing in his dream, and it's showing it to us. I'm not for sure, because Freddy can only, Freddy can manipulate reality a little bit, 
I guess depending on how many souls he's took and how much power he has. But um, it kind of seems like the guy's awake when it's happening, but I don't know. It's not really a big deal. Once again, kind of a little nitpick. So he gets hung. Uh, cool scene. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, basic death scene. Um, earlier in the film, you had a uh, you had the uh, Nancy's first like encounter with Freddy when she was at school and she was like falling asleep in fucking class. And you got Lynn Shay there as the the teacher, which is Bob Shay's sister. She's in a couple films that I like. I don't mind Lynn Shay, but uh, she falls asleep in class. She fucking like sees uh, Tina, her friend, getting drugged around in a body bag in the hallway and like. Scratching at the body bag saying, Nancy. <laughs> it's pretty fucking creepy. And uh, so she decides to go out and go look around and see what's going on. She runs into this woman and hits her. And she's like got Freddy Krueger's sweat around. She's supposed to be the hall monitor, I guess. And she goes, where's your pass? And Nancy goes, screw your pass. <laughs> Which in, once again would be reused for New Nightmare. But uh, So that was funny. That's a really cool scene with uh, Tina. It's the first appearance of Tina in the body bag and everything, which I love. That is a really cool angle for the film and really cool. Um, they make a homage to that in the remake and it's like so shoved and thrown in there that it's so stupid and horribly done. But uh, so she goes down into the boiler room um, after she uh, runs to the supposed hall monitor. She goes and Nancy goes down into the boiler room. Fucking Freddy pops out and he like pulls up his shirt and like cuts part of his uh, chest I believe. It's like green shit oozing out of it which is very cool. He chases off after her, and once again, the score is really cool and really tense, and I love the score to this film. I forgot who did the score. I forgot, but it's still fucking awesome. I know that it'll probably come to me who the composer was right after I do this review, but I forgot. Uh, if anybody knows, put it in the comments, because, well, hold on just a second. I'll fucking check it. Well, I'll be a motherfucker. It don't even say. <laughs> but either way, the score of this film kicks ass. But anyway, um, so he's chasing after, and she like burns herself on this fucking pipe, and then she wakes up in class, and she still got the burn mark on her, and the score is like playing really spooky music, and it's like really cool because that would fucking trip me out as well. The best you no know, slasher films and horror films are the ones that that have are, are that are that connect. You can connect with the characters, I think. Or kind of take like real life trauma and real life events and uh, build like a horrific horror tale about it. Kind of. Movies like that and uh, movies where you can connect with the characters are kind of like my kind of my personal favorite horror films. Like this right here, I feel for Nancy. I do. I mean, you connect with the character and her parents are divorced and her mom's like an alcoholic. And uh, she's obviously having a tough time with her friends dying off. So you kind of connect with the character and I root for her. I do. I want her to survive. So, um, yeah, and she's got the burn mark on her hand, so that's, that's pretty cool. I like that. So Rod's dead. They're having the funeral. Uh, and then she's describing what Freddie looks like. Um, you can kind of get the idea of her parents know, you know, who this guy is. You know, who, and they obviously know more than what they're saying. Um... Nancy's mom, Marge, I believe is the character's name, takes her to a dream clinic to kind of, you know, see what the fuck's wrong with her. And they hook her up to these machines, and she's kind of, like, freaking out and doing, like, an exorcist-style, like, thing or whatever. She's, like, uh, 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 like, jerking up and down, which is kind of cool. And she fucking, like, pulls Freddy's hat out of the dream, and it's got his name sewn in his hat. Kind of like, well, it may, must have been a Christmas gift. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's how that was, uh, that was cool. That was really cool idea that she can bring stuff out of her dream is like fucking awesome and very inventive this film has a lot of inventive stuff in it um but that that's why it's Wes Craven's you know crowning achievement of his film career because this film is just so inventive which I'm surprised that it took him even this long to come up with a film like this with a killer in their dreams because you know that's an inventive idea you know I figured you figure somebody would have said you know um, you know, killer in the dreams, you know, that's kind of an inventive idea, you know, getting killed in your dreams. Uh, <laughs> but I guess not, or at least they didn't, uh, they weren't able to do it in a quality way, like Wes Craven does it here. But anyway, so she's got his hat, um, her mom, dad, I guess still don't want to believe her, or at least her mom doesn't. Um, her mom finally breaks down and tells her who Freddy is, that he was a child murderer, and that the parents found out about it, but he got out of it. Because somebody didn't sign the fucking search warrant in the right place. And he got, uh, they tracked him down and to 
the place where he used to take his kids and fucking burned him alive. That's why he looks so burnt up in dreams and his look and everything. Which Freddy has an awesome look in this film with his burnt look and everything. Um, so she broke down and told her what happened. She still got Freddy's glove, for fuck's sake. Um, so that night, um, <laughs> well, uh, Nancy's the character Nancy kind of gets the idea that you can turn your back and take away the energy, like that you've gave to this like a uh, creature in your dreams that has power over you. Because she, uh, well, Johnny Depp has, like, been reading about it, and he, uh, or reading about, like, this, uh, way of dreaming that these people used to do, where you can, like, take away the energy of, like, a monster you've created in your dreams. Because apparently Freddy's able to enter the dreams of people, be, or, uh, well, the Elm Street kids, because, you know, the parents obviously were the ones that burned him, so they're marked, the kids are. He's taking his vengeance out on them. Uh, he's taking away their children for what they did to him. But, uh, so you kind of get the idea that he can enter their dreams, though. Um, not just because of that, but also because that, uh, <clears throat> their fear and kind of like, uh, how they get scared and stuff of him, I guess. Kind of like their fear, you know, feeds him, helps him grow stronger. And so basically she needs to take, like, take her, take the power she gave to him back away from him. And which I guess would turn him back into an ordinary spirit. <clears throat> Sorry, burp. <laughs> but I guess would turn him back into an ordinary spirit and lose his dream powers, I guess. Or at least, or at least would make him lose the ability to enter her dreams. But anyway, it's kind of a little, little iffy. But you, you basically get the idea. And they reuse it again in Freddy vs. Jason. But anyway, so she wants to do that. So she wants to bring Freddy out into the dreams. I mean, out of the dreams into reality, where he's you know quasi mortal, <laughs> quasi human, whatever you want to call it. Not so much human, but can be killed. So she wants Johnny Depp's help. But later that night, her mom has put bars on all the windows and everything. And she can't get out to go you know, talk to Johnny Depp. Because Johnny Depp's parents don't want him to see her anymore. And that he falls asleep in his bed. When he wasn't supposed to, once again. <laughs> but, um. So she tries to warn him, but she can't get out of the fucking house. Because there's bars everywhere. Uh, her mom's like drunk off alcohol, off her ass. Um. And then you get the like the cool the second coolest death scene in this whole movie. I love this scene. This scene is so inventive and cool. Fucking the giant Depp falls asleep on the bed listening to the radio. Freddy's arm comes up through the bed, grabs him, pulls him down in the bed, and the fucking TV and everything goes down with it. And then like a big like twister or tornado of blood shoots out. And it's like fucking like six seven hundred gallons of blood. Looks like it fucking like floods the entire room and like hits the ceiling, floods the whole room. And it's so it's such an awesome scene. That was that was great right there. It, I give props to Craven for coming up with that one. If he did, you know, I don't know if he did or not. Maybe somebody on the crew just said, you know what, look cool. You know what, I mean, you know what, would look cool. A fucking blood tornado. But either way, that was awesome. That was really cool. So she obviously has to do it herself now. And you get a oh yeah, you get a really funny scene where Freddy's tongue like fucking comes out of the phone when he's like, I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy. Like telling her that you know he's obviously gonna kill her boyfriend. Uh, I like that. It shows once again that Freddy can infect the real world just a little bit. Not much, but just a little. She obviously has to now do it on her own. Her dad's over there, you know, with the coroner and the police nearby checking out Johnny Depp's, you know, death scene. If they don't know something's up by now in this town, I don't know what's going to clue them in. Obviously, you know, the shit don't happen every day. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so she's wanting to go to sleep and uh, bring Freddy out of the dream. She sets her watch, or sets her timer. She goes to sleep, and you get a creepy scene where she's, like, fucking, um, finding all, like, these objects that were, like, things that her friends and stuff had, like, Johnny Depp's bloody headphones and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, fucking, like, you get a couple continued arrow shots in this film where Freddy has no hat when he should have a hat, and he, uh, has a hat when he shouldn't have a hat, but those are, like, little nitpicks, and they're few and far between, maybe, like, three times. I mean, they're not really a big deal, and they're paced, like, I mean, there's like so much that happens before it gets to that to the scenes where the continued arrows are that you just don't give a fuck. I bar only reason I noticed them is because I've seen this film like seven thousand times. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> and then uh, she's like, "Come and show yourself, you bastard!" or <laughs> something like that. And Freddy fucking jumps out. She leaps like from the top of the boiler room and uh, falls like in front of her house into a rose bush. Was just like really cool. That kind of like. Another cool, another cool dream thing where she like one location, you know, bam, you know, pop to another one. That's cool. I like that. That is cool. 
uh, why the remake couldn't come up with stuff like this or even anything remotely interesting, I don't know. I guess Wes Craven just has a more creative mind than whoever the fuck directed the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. I don't even know. I don't want to know. I'll find out when I do my review for that one, but I'll thank God there's, you know, a lot of sequels before I get to that one. But anyway, so Freddy, like, fucking jumps up out of the rose bush. Um, he's like, hey, Nancy, and she fucking just jumps at him. Then her timer goes off. She wakes up in the bed. She's like, I'm crazy after all because Freddy ain't there. Well, she, she thinks he ain't there. Then this is a jump scare that I love. This one really works. She's like, I'm crazy after all, and then he fucking leaps up behind her and goes, ah, <laughs> which is, like, really cool. I love that. She splits his fucking brains out with a coffee pot that she, like, hides underneath her table. Or not her table, but her fucking bed. I love that uh, that jump scare. She's got booby traps rigged all like in the house, so she can like beat the shit out of Freddy. Which I'm kind of like, that's a little home aloneish to me. Kind of a little silly. I mean, why don't she just you know go steal a gun or something, just blow his fucking head off? But um, I guess that may be a little bit too easy. It's more you know more interesting if she does it with her wits and stuff. I mean, obviously Freddy's only quasi human, so he'd probably take a couple shots to at least take him down. But uh, it makes it more interesting out of the way with her using her skills and booby traps and everything. I just think, well, as long as the booby traps aren't done silly. Wes Craven has a thing for some reason in his movies, a lot of them, that he wants to do booby traps. I know Last House on the Left did booby traps too, and I think People Under the Stars did as well. But as long as they're not silly, it's fine. So Freddy takes off after he's got like a sledgehammer fucking booby trap hanging up uh, in front of the door, falls down, hits him in the gut, and uh, she he fucking like, it hits a trip wire and this little bomb explodes. It is pretty cool. Um, he's like, I'll kill you slow. And fucking this bomb explodes. Because uh, he hits a trip wire. It's like a gunpowder, I believe. Or shotgun powder, I mean, I think. In this uh, light bulb. And he like hits the trip wire attached to it. And it fucking blows up and hits him. <laughs> the shock wave hits him or whatever. Hmm. That was cool. Um, they make it downstairs. Uh, she fucking sets Freddy on fire, which is another pretty cool scene, burning his ass again. Uh, that was cool. Freddy's like, no, no, no! <laughs> and she fucking, like, well, she's poured gasoline on him, she burns his ass the hell and back. Uh, John Saxton makes it over there, you know, he wants to know what the fuck's going on. Uh, the, they make it upstairs. She, uh, he's fucking killing her mom, fighting with her and John Saxton. Uh, I know Nancy fucking splits his damn brains out with a chair, I believe. Um, John Saxton covers him up and pulls the blanket off and Freddy's like disappeared and her mom's like a skeleton. Skeleton effect kind of looks a little, eh, dated. But uh, you only see it for like one second and then she kind of like sinks down into the bed, into the fucking bed. And I'm kind of like, okay. This is back though when they didn't really have like a complete idea, I don't think, about what Freddy could and couldn't do. So with this ending shot here of like the mom sinking like skeleton into the bed or whatever, it's kind of like a little weird compared to some of the stuff that happens in the rest of the series. But, I mean, it kind of works. It's just, you know, you're kind of like, what the fuck happened to her? Where'd her body go? Did it sink through the bed and go fall down to the other, like, other floor underneath it? Or, <laughs> or what? Well, what the fuck happened? <laughs> but anyway, because it's supposed to be reality. But, you know, that's, that's, that's probably is, you know, just a tiny plot hole. But, you know, once again, the next scene, I like, uh, I like better than, <laughs> I mean, the next scene is cooler, you know, is one, well, the next scene is one of my favorites in the film, so it automatically, you know, just overtakes and throws anything that weak like that away, uh, so John Saxon leaves, and she's like, she, she tells him she'll be down in a minute, and he, Fred, Freddy fucking comes up out of the bed, and a really cool scene, Robert Hill comes up out of the bed. He's like talking to her. He's like, she thinks she was going to get away from me. <laughs> and uh, she's like, I know the secret now, Freddy. Or, or you're not alive. This is just a dream. This whole thing is just a dream. You're nothing. You're shit. And he fucking lunges at her and evaporates. And she's like, took, her in took the energy she gave him back. So he should be banished from her dreams. Now this, this right here is the weakest point of the entire film. This ending makes no fucking sense. And it's basically because, you know, there's two people arguing, Wes Craven and Bob Shea couldn't decide on how the fuck to end the film. So they made a compromise ending. <laughs> uh, kind of like, I believe, not to show Freddy, but to have the stripes on the car, you know, look like Freddy's sweater or something like that. But Nancy goes outside, her friends are ma magically back alive now for some reason. It's morning. 
Uh, you don't know if it's a dream or not, and how could it be a dream? Did she fall asleep, you know, after she, <laughs> right after she left the room where Freddy was in there, after she just took away his energy? It makes no sense, no matter how you try to explain it. I know some fans have tried to explain it, but it makes no sense at all. It don't. This is one of the weak points of the film, and in the other sequels and in part three where Nancy comes back, they don't even try to explain this ending because there's no way to explain it. It just makes no fucking sense. Um, but uh, her friends are back, and she like gets into the, her mom back alive too, and she like gets in the car and fucking the roof of the car comes down. And it's got stripes on it like Freddy's sweater, so you kind of get the idea that well Freddy's still alive. Obviously, that Nancy didn't win, or at least beat him, but didn't overcome him, or didn't destroy him. Um, and so the vehicle's, like, driving off, her mom's, like, waving, like, <laughs> the fucking Freddy's arm busts through the window behind her, behind her, her mom, and fucking grabs Marge and pulls her through the fucking wind, little tiny window, and if you put it in slow motion, you can see it's a doll, <laughs> but it happens really quick, so it's not too big a deal, then you get a little creepy scene where the kids are, like, fucking jump roping, uh, singing about Freddy. Um, the ending is the weakest part just because it makes no fucking sense, and that's what puts this film below films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween. But it's still a really terrific film, and it is a, it is A class horror. It is. It's an A class horror slasher film. It's a great film, but that ending right there is what weakens it. It is. Um. <clears throat> but and Robert England as Freddy, he's got to be like my second or first favorite horror film character known to man or horror slasher. He's just terrific in the role. Um, but in this review here, this is a four-star film at the possible four. It's a really great film, only weakened by the ending where they just couldn't decide what the fuck to fuck how to end it. But um, it's still a really great film, and I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it if you're a horror fan or especially if you're a slasher fan, which if you are, I'd be really surprised if you haven't seen it already. But this is a terrific film, and I definitely recommend watching it. And I'll see you guys again with a review for Freddy's Revenge, which is a sequel that most people hate. I don't think is I don't think it's great, but I don't think it's that bad either. And we'll talk about that when I see you guys again with that review. So until then, I hope you guys have had a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you guys again with a review for Freddy's Revenge.